Okay, what we're looking at today is the miracles that happened throughout the American Revolution. And as you see the number of them and how the turning points in so many battles uh, that were fought were as a direct result of incredible, surprising changes in the weather uh, that were just absolutely ideal for the colonial troops and a disaster for the British. Um, And I think you'll be somewhat surprised if you see how much actually occurred and why it was that um, General George Washington ultimately wound up saying that it was through the intervention of divine providence that we had a nation. Now, if you go back in the scriptures, you see that God performed miracles for Moses and the Israelites as they escaped from Egypt and as they fought the various battles under Joshua. God spoke through Moses, and, he's, and, and Moses reminded them that they had to remember the interventions of God. And he said this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Now, in America... It seems as if our children don't necessarily know um, the miracles and the things that happened so that we would have a nation and so that we would have the freedoms that we have today. Joshua, um, when he went through the land, starting certainly with Jericho, but even before that, the crossing of the Jordan, uh, he saw and the Israelites saw the power of God intervening on their behalf. God spoke through Joshua and said, you yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. And then in Joshua 5, God stopped the waters of the Jordan River at flood stage, at flood stage. And then, of course, the incredible story of this um, unbelievable strategy uh, to conquer Jericho. The Israelites there with their back to a river at flood stage with no way to retreat and in front of them, Uh, this, uh, for them, massive city with the high, thick walls and uh, no simple way with an untrained army because their people had never fought before. They had been in the wilderness for 40 years, you may recall. Um, And as they stood there, the battle plan was to march around seven times and blow trumpets. And it worked because God intervened on their behalf. God performed miracles for Joshua, for the Israelites. And the people of Israel were instructed to remember these things. Isaiah admonished them, remember God's miracles. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. God guides the course of history. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. That's in the book of Job. The book of Daniel, the entire book deals with this subject and talks about the kingdoms that God will raise up after Daniel and after uh, the Babylonians and the nations that he also will tear down. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 had to learn the lesson that God puts in place whomever he chooses. The Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. He removes kings and he raises up kings. Well, God today continues to intervene. Amazingly, we now have peace agreements between Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, and soon Oman, and likely others. 
we have seen in our lifetime, for some of us our lifetime, for others just shortly before, we have seen Israel reestablished as a state. We have seen their capital um, reestablished and now recognized. Um, uh, you know, Jerusalem is now recognized as the capital of Israel. Uh, it was thought for decades that if the United States moved its embassy to Jerusalem, that war would break out. Instead, the United States moved its embassy and peace has broken out. God is at work in the affairs of men. Now, interestingly, God preserved George Washington so that George Washington consistently cheated death. And the stories are amazing, and I'll share just a few with you today. In 1755, during the French and Indian War, uh, George Washington, actually at that point he was Colonel George Washington, 23 years old, was an aide to General Braddock, and he was marching to capture Fort Duquesne with 1,400 British troops. They arrived near Pittsburgh and were attacked by a French and Indian force. During the battle, General Braddock was killed and every single officer on horseback was shot except for one. And that sole exception was George Washington. He had two horses shot out from under him and at least four bullets went through his clothing. Throughout the French and Indian War, he had dysentery the entire time. And one of the byproducts of that was that he wound up having to sit particularly upright in the saddle, and he made a very good target. He was uh, six foot one or six foot two. He weighed well over 200 pounds. He was a very big man for that day, and he was an excellent target. And yet, no bullet, no musket ball, no cannon um, fire ever reached him. No weapon formed against him ever prospered. He wrote to his brother, um, quote, but by the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. For I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt, although death was leveling my companions on every side. A, a Native American who fought in the battle was later quoted as saying this, quote, Washington was never born to be killed by a bullet. I had 17 fair fires at him with my rifle, and after all that could not bring him to the ground. And then during the 1777 Battle of Princeton, Washington rode on his horse 90 feet from the British troops, bullets whizzing all around him, men dying by his side. And when his troops expressed worries about him getting shot, he just said, parade with me, my fine fellows. We will have them soon. He also couldn't be killed by disease while he was young. He had virtually all of the major deadly diseases of that day. He survived tuberculosis, dysentery, pneumonia, malaria, smallpox, and diphtheria. Most people in that day died from just one of those. He had them all at one time or another. And not only did he survive, he learned from his experience with smallpox how to inoculate his troops against smallpox. And then ultimately he died in bed at the age of 67 from epiglottitis. Um, he had uh, wooden teeth, false teeth. It's one of the reasons that he typically kept his mouth closed uh, when um, his portrait was done and the pictures you see of him show him with a, a steadfast jaw. Um, and uh, those teeth many times created problems for him and may well have led to uh, the uh, infection that he had on the back of his tongue that ultimately took his life. In the early spring of 1776, the Boston hurricane intervened. Now this is in the spring. With the British in control of Boston, Washington ordered cannons brought through the snow from Fort Ticonderoga, uh, which was about 300 miles, in order to forf uh, fortify Dorchester Heights overlooking the Boston Harbor. General Howe, 
who was the British general over all of the troops at that point, all the British troops, ordered an amphibious assault on the American position. And it was at that point that God intervened. The night before the assault was to begin, um, a hurricane, and it's interesting, when you read it, the spelling they had was H-U-R-R-Y-C-A-N-E, or a terrible storm, a southeaster of gale proportions, hit the Boston area, totally disrupted Howe's plans. He wound up having to call off his attack on the Americans because of, quote, the badness of the weather, unquote. And as a result of the sudden storm uh, and the strength of the American position on the heights, uh, where they were able to command movement in and out of Boston Harbor, Howe ultimately had to order the British troops to evacuate Boston. Now, that was 1776, early spring. And then Washington wrote after that uh, to his brother, quote, this remarkable interposition of providence is for some wise purpose, I have not a doubt. Now, in the summer of 1776, so a couple months later, you had the three miracles of Battle of Long Island. We had spoken about that last week, but let me refresh your memory just quickly. General Howe had 30,000 trained soldiers. Um, Washington's fledgling and inferior force of 8,000 was backed up against the raging East River in the midst of a torrential downpour. So they were on the western portion of Long Island, just across from New York City and uh, nowhere to go, totally surrounded. And uh, a thousand of their men had already been killed and he had lost uh, a couple of his officers. And at that point, if Howe had pressed the attack, he would have completely defeated uh, virtually the entire colonial army at that point. And then you had the first miracle. Instead of attacking, Howe decided to wait one day Washington then called for a prayer meeting, and you had the second miracle. At 11 p.m. that evening, the storm that had been going on abated, the wind died down, the rain stopped, the East River was, quote, as smooth as glass, unquote. The troops started crossing, and a gentle breeze came up behind them to push them along. But even with this this, uh, strange miracle, they knew it would still be impossible to get all the troops across to Manhattan Island before daybreak. And then the third miracle, just before daybreak, not quite dawn, thick fog draped over them all, hiding them from British troops. And when the fog lifted, the British commander was shocked because Washington's troops had escaped. It was universal agreement. The Battle of Long Island was won because of the hand of God. One American soldier wrote this, quote, providentially for us, a great fog arose which prevented the enemy from seeing our retreat, unquote. The outcome of this battle has been described as, quote, so astonishing that many, including General Washington, attributed the safe retreat of the American army to the hand of God, unquote. If the wind, rain, and the fog which were termed, by the way, the heavenly messenger, had not intervened for the Americans, they would have been captured. Washington would have been hanged, and the revolution would have come to an early end. But it didn't happen that way, because God intervened. God intervened again in the Christmas miracle of 1776. Washington's troops had been uh, pursued and, f- and, and had been fleeing from the far superior British forces. And they were encamped at Valley Forge. Morale was low. You've undoubtedly heard the stories of the men who had frostbite, who walked with no shoes for miles. Um, they had little food. They had little money. Uh, people were deserting, and the American army had dwindled to about 2,000 at Valley Forge. It was at that point that Washington decided to cross the Delaware River. Now, it was filled with ice, uh, and he was going to launch a surprise attack on the British in Trenton, right across the river. If you've ever been to Washington's Crossing, you know that it's not a horribly wide river, but when it is uh, flooding, it is quite treacherous. 
Well, the Americans attacked at sunrise on December 26th during a driving snowstorm. The wind was at their backs and it was blowing into the faces of the mercenary Hessian troops, who, by the way, had been celebrating and, uh, you know, it was Christmas. Uh, they, many of them were drunk. They certainly did not expect an attack. The more normal situation, according to uh, the, the normal manner of uh, fighting in those days, would have been to fight during the daytime. And here it was uh, uh, not quite um, uh, uh, daybreak, and the Americans were attacking. And in less than an hour, the Americans had captured nearly a thousand Hessians, and they lost only a few men. Well, God again protected General Washington. You know, we look at crossing the Delaware, and it's not that wide a river. And how dangerous was it? Yeah, it was cold and so on. Well, actually, there were huge chunks of ice. Uh, the water was dark. There was no moon because it was covered by the clouds. And... Uh, there was the real risk that the boats would capsize. Washington set out with three boats to make the crossing, and only one boat made it, the boat that he was in. Because someone falling into the water would likely die, um, even if they managed to get out of the boat. Two Continental soldiers who survived the crossing uh, stopped to rest by the side of the road, and when they were found the next morning, they were frozen to death. Henry Knox, who was an artillery officer, wrote this, quote, Providence seemed to have smiled on every part of this enterprise, unquote. Then we get to 1777 in the summer. There was the miracle rain that turned the tide of war. British General John Burgoyne marched down the Hudson River Valley from Canada. He had 7,000 men, and he was going to join up with General Howe, who was supposed to be marching north all the way to Albany. Unfortunately for Burgoyne, he was stopped at Saratoga by an army of more than 15,000 Americans, so about twice the size of his troops. And they were particularly angered by the brutality that had been inflicted by Burgoyne's Native American allies. And then Burgoyne and his troops wisely began a retreat. Well, a sudden massive rainstorm, another miracle, turned the roads into a slimy bog, thick mud, forcing them to slow enough, imagine with the cannons and the troops and the rest what it was like, so that the Americans could cross the Hudson ahead of them and attack from the south, thereby blocking Burgoyne's escape. Burgoyne and 6,000 of his troops were forced to surrender. General Howe now, coming up from the south, was stopped by contrary winds. Howe was coming up the Hudson to bring in reinforcements and supplies from England. Um, the defeat of Burgoyne, who was one of Britain's best generals in North America, was a shock. When the news got to London, it was a shock generally amongst the British troops. But it was viewed as a miracle in Paris. And, and Ben Franklin was in Paris at the time. The French were being entreated to help and to provide their navy uh, to help the colonials. They had been resistant to that. And then when this occurred, this was the turning point, because France then decided to come into the conflict on the side of the Americans. Washington wrote this, quote, I most devoutly congratulate my country and every well-wisher to the cause on this signal stroke of providence, unquote. Roger Sherman, talking about this battle, um, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, wrote this, this is the Lord's doing and marvelous in our eyes. In 1780, God breaks up a conspiracy that would have ended the war with the British winning and the Americans losing. General Benedict Arnold actually was a great general, great tactician, great strategist. Um, he had uh, really been the hero of the Battle of Saratoga, but very underappreciated. Uh, his wife was a loyalist, and you can only imagine that she may have whispered in his ear, they need to be giving you more. 
Um, but regardless, she was a loyalist and she was his go-between to the British. Well, he was prideful, he was disillusioned, and he decided that he would work with the British to give them the American garrison at West Point. And he would do this in return for 20,000 pounds and a high ranking uh, in the um, British Army. And he presumed that he would do very, very well and that this was the opportunity. His accomplice was Major John Andre, who was head of the British Secret Service in America and adjutant general, an aide uh, to General Howe. Uh, he had come up the river on a ship and for a variety of reasons, after meeting with Benedict Arnold, uh, could not go back that way. The ship had been um, attacked by the colonials. And um, so he wound up borrowing some clothing, dressed as a civilian, and attempted to get back uh, to the British lines. As he was on his way back, he met three centuries, colonial centuries, but because one was wearing a Hessian top coat, he presumed that they were British soldiers. And so he introduced himself as a British soldier and requested their help. And that's when they made it clear that um, they were colonials and he was their prisoner, or he was now their prisoner. And then he just um, said, well, I was just testing you. Uh, it didn't, they didn't accept that. And then hidden in his stocking were maps of West Point and the entire plan of attack, all in Benedict Arnold's handwriting. Arnold was warned in time. Actually, one of his direct reports had heard about it, um, and um, he, he couldn't believe that Benedict Arnold was a traitor, and so he, he contacted Benedict Arnold through a messenger to let him know because he himself was concerned that he would have problems when it turned out that this was not true. Um, well, Arnold fled to England. He lived out the rest of his life there. Andre ultimately was hung as a spy. It's interesting, when you read the story of, um, of Major John Andre, he, he was actually a, a, an incredible man uh, he was, um, uh, he went to his death very bravely, and um, he even put the noose around his own neck. He um, understood that this was the cause, uh, this was the cost of what he had done. Now, Washington would have been captured if the garrison at West Point had indeed been taken based on Arnold's plan. Throughout the colonies, the surprise capture of Major Andre and the discovery of Arnold's treachery were universally seen as an act of divine protection. Ezra Stiles, who was the president of Yale at that time, wrote, quote, a providential miracle detected the conspiracy of Arnold, the body of the American army, then at West Point with His Excellency General Washington himself, would have been rendered into the hands of the enemy. One little correction, Ezra Stiles was sometime later, uh, the president of Yale. Then the miracle at the Battle of Cowpens. Very interesting. Um, January 1781. The American general was Daniel Morgan, and he defeated an advancing British force under General Cornwallis. And that happened at the Battle of Cowpens, which was in South Carolina. And this has been called a tactical masterpiece and the ultimate turning point in the war. After the battle... Morgan retreated north, where he was chased by the British. Um, the British would have caught him and potentially defeated him, except they were stopped by, again, a sudden change in the weather. God sent a torrential downpour. Cornwallis reached the Catawba River, chasing after Morgan only hours after the Americans had crossed. Quote, but a sudden storm made the river impassable. The British nearly overtook the Americans at the Yadkin River, but again rains flooded the river, slowing the British, unquote. And then another flash flood blocked the British at the Dan River, which ultimately allowed the Americans to cross into friendly territory in Virginia. The British General Henry Clinton 
describe the events in this way. Here, the royal army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen, almost miraculously, to let the enemy over. So some echoes, perhaps, of Moses or Joshua crossing a river, and the, the ones who were pursuing unable to do the same. George Washington wrote this in March of 1781, quote, We have abundant reasons to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions in our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence, for all other resources seem to have failed us, unquote. In fact, it's amazing that the ragtag army assembled by General Washington um, ultimately wound up defeating the greatest military force of its time. October 1781, you had the miracle of the shifting winds. French and British fleets fought in the Atlantic East, um, I'm sorry, in the Atlantic, just east of the Chesapeake Bay. The shifting winds that were occurring prolonged the battle sufficiently so that a squadron of French ships with troops, a separate squadron with troops and supplies, uh, wound up being able to slip into Chesapeake Bay and thereby blocked Cornwallis from receiving uh, some supplies that he desperately needed from the British ships seeking to get to him. 17,000 French and American troops um, then surrounded him in Yorktown. Cornwallis attempted a nighttime breakout. You may recall this was a peninsula. Um, a nighttime breakout by starting to ferry his regular troops across the York River just the same way that Washington had done in Long Island. Well, the first group of soldiers made it across. The second group did not and actually got swept down river. And then there was yet more of a miracle. The French fleet arrived at exactly the right moment to delay the British and bring supplies and reinforcements to General Washington. So now with diminished troops, Cornwallis was stuck. The British escape plan was stymied uh, when this sudden and severe rain squall blew the second contingent of soldiers downriver. And so with his smaller force, he was reasonably well trapped. And this sudden, quote, adverse turn of the weather completely disrupted the attempted breakout, unquote. And as a British colonel commented at the time, Thus expired the last hope of the British army. And Cornwallis then surrendered the next day. And as he surrendered, a British military band played the tune, the world turned upside down. Nobody could have imagined that this would happen. There was no question the British were going to win. And had it been a fair fight, they would have, but it wasn't fair because God was on the side of the colonial army. Cornwallis surrendered the next day. The American victory at Yorktown has now been called one of the most influential battles in history because it ended an eight-year struggle for independence and launched America on a path to becoming a world power. And it was all aided by sudden and dramatic changes in the weather. Everyone knew it was God who won the war. After the Battle of Yorktown, Ezra Stiles wrote, who but God could have ordained the critical arrival of the Gallic French fleet so as to assist in the siege of Yorktown. George Washington later wrote, it will not be believed that such a force as Great Britain has employed for eight years in this country could be baffled in their plan of subjugating it. The singular interpositions of providence in our feeble condition were such as could scarcely escape the attention of the most unobserving well, the perseverance of the armies of the United States through almost every possible suffering and discouragement for the space of eight long years was little short of a standing miracle. God controlled the weather that saved the nation. We see in the scriptures that God controls the weather. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat, they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. They came to Jesus. They woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And he got up 
and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where's your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? We live today in challenging times, and it can seem as if the direction of history is overwhelmingly opposed to the Christian viewpoint, is overwhelmingly opposed to those who would seek the face of God. And you can see it on every side. If you look at America in the 50s, or if you look at America in the 1700s or 1800s, you can say that we strayed very far from there. And you can think that the great American experiment is at an end. However, the most important thing to remember is that God intervenes in the affairs of men. And when the time is right, and typically it's at the height of battle, when the battle appears lost, God steps in. That is the pattern of scripture. That is the pattern of the American Revolution. And I believe that we will see in the days ahead the interventions of God.